There are three big problems with used vehicle appraisals. One, manually sifting through comp vehicles. Two, old book values and ghost comps. Three, no recon visibility. You can solve them all with AutoVision. Now available from Reynolds and Reynolds. Learn more at reyrey.com slash use dash cars. That's R-E-Y, R-E-Y dot com slash used dash cars. Want to dive deeper into the topics you hear about on Daily Drive? We're offering listeners a special offer, 20% off a one-year automotive news digital subscription. That gets you access to all of our news, information, and analysis made for automotive industry leaders like you. Go to autonews.com slash daily drive promo to redeem. Welcome to Daily Drive for Wednesday, February 7th, 2024. I'm Jamie Butters, Executive Editor of Automotive News in Detroit. And I'm Kellen Walker in Las Vegas. Today on the show, Ford loses a half billion in Q4 thanks to a special accounting charge. Penske's earnings fall by more than a third, and GM reaches a huge battery materials deal with LG Chem. Plus, we hear from Nissan's U.S. Vice President of Sales and Regional Operations, Judy Wheeler, about mentoring the next generation of automotive leaders. Oftentimes, when you just say, I go into a meeting, but my voice isn't heard. Those are a very typical conversation that comes up in a mentoring session. Yep. And we'll talk about what are some of those tools of how do you get your voice heard. Let's run through all the news you need to know to keep up in the auto industry. Ford says it lost $526 million in the fourth quarter. That was mostly attributable to a non-cash $1.7 billion pre-tax accounting loss related to retiree benefits. Revenue improved 4% in the quarter to $46 billion. For the full year, Ford posted net income of $4.3 billion on $10.4 billion in adjusted earnings before interest and taxes. That's in line with the guidance of 10 to $10.5 billion, a range it lowered because of the 41-day UAW strike. As a result, about 58,000 UAW members will get profit-sharing checks, averaging $10,400 next month. That includes temporary workers for the first time. Ford CEO Jim Farley said during the earnings call that the company was more focused on results in 2023. Our underlying business is getting better. Despite the UAW strike, our auto profits were up year over year. And we're getting much more discipline on capital. Not just where we allocate, but more importantly, how much we spend and when. The full-year EBIT figure includes a $14.7 billion profit from its internal combustion and commercial businesses, Ford's electric vehicle business lost $4.7 billion, slightly more than the $4.5 billion loss it had expected. Ford's net income compares with a $2 billion loss in 2022. Meanwhile, the automaker plans some big cost cuts as part of a drive to boost profitability and beat back inflation. That includes removing some much-hyped features from its vehicles, including automated parallel parking. Penske Automotive's fourth quarter net income slid by a third. The auto retail giant says its earnings were affected by higher interest costs, a non-cash goodwill impairment charge, and lower earnings from its Penske Transportation Solutions investment. Penske says it faced a $21 million increase in interest costs driven by higher interest rates and inventory levels. Interest expense for floor planning in the quarter rose 76% to almost $39 million. Fourth quarter results included an impairment charge of more than $40 million related to its used vehicle dealership's international unit. Net income for the quarter fell 36% to $192 million. Revenue improved 3.7% to about $7.3 billion. Foreign currency exchange helped quarterly revenue by 130 million. LG Chem has agreed to provide more than $18.5 billion of cathode materials to General Motors. The agreement will see LG provide more than 500,000 tons of cathode materials to the U.S. carmaker starting in 2026. The materials will be produced from LG's plant in Tennessee. According to a statement from LG, GM should be able to make around 5 million EVs using those materials. The cathode arrangement is part of a longer-term supply commitment between the two global corporations. The Korean chemicals giant is pledging to provide GM with some 950,000 tons of cathodes through the end of the decade. 
and Tesla staff are bracing for possible job cuts. That's after managers were asked to say whether each of their employees' positions is critical. According to people who spoke with Bloomberg, U.S. managers had to make those assessments of their deputies' roles in recent days. Some of the people said Tesla sent out the question about each job after canceling some employees' biannual performance reviews. The ask is consistent with CEO Elon Musk's emphasis on cost-cutting efforts amid a slowdown in Tesla sales growth. The EV maker is trying to do more with less, and in that spirit, Tesla's German plant produced 6,000 cars in a week for the first time. The automaker is waiting for approval to double the plant's capacity to a million cars annually. And those are today's headlines. Jamie, Ford lost half a billion dollars in the fourth quarter due to retiree benefits. Is it safe to say the company has a long road ahead in 2024? Well, it's it's a long road this year. It's a long road overall. You know, there's some progress. It went from losing two billion last year to making four billion this year. And like I always say, it's it's better to make money than to lose money. The problem is, you know, you're competing for capital with other automakers, and uh, the other automakers are farther along and they're doing better. GM made ten billion dollars net last year. Toyota made almost ten billion dollars net just in the fourth quarter. So Ford's got a lot to do on quality. They've got a lot to do on cutting the losses in their EV line while they continue to, you know, maximize what they can with the F-150 and their fleet customers. Gotcha. Coming up, Nissan's Judy Wheeler talks about her passion for mentoring and how she hopes to help more women land leadership positions. That's next on Daily Drive. Data is the backbone of your used vehicle department. You need it to find accurate comp sets and to best understand your market in order to make precise appraisal and pricing decisions. But it feels like you're always struggling to get the information you need. How much time do you spend sifting through comps because there are outliers that don't match the vehicle you're appraising? Do you frequently make manual adjustments to pricing recommendations? Reynolds' newest inventory management solution, AutoVision, can help. AJ McGowan, president and founder of AutoVision, explains how. If you look at the way that cars are traditionally priced, you know, you can get down to specifics in terms of, you know, what zip code is it in and, you know, what options does it have on it? And, you know, some of those sorts of things. Um, but the thing that's never really taken into account um, is, you know, that dealer's, you know, specific view of the market. Our goal with AutoVision was to use, you know, technology that's available now to do real-time processing which allows dealers to really set the their view of the market into AutoVision. And then we use our tools to analyze the data that's there and show them this is what this vehicle is worth to you. AutoVision can help you run your used vehicle department with precise comp sets, real-time inventory data, and reconditioning insights. Visit reyrey.com slash used dash cars to find out more. That's R-E-Y, R-E-Y dot com slash used Dash cars. Welcome back to Daily Drive. I'm Jamie Butters with Kellen Walker. Judy Wheeler is Nissan's U.S. Vice President of Sales and Regional Operations, but she holds another title that she's proud of. Wheeler leads Nissan's Women's Business Synergy Team, which focuses on helping women make their voices heard and advance in their careers. The group started with only women, but it has expanded to include men, who she says now account for about 40% of participants. I spoke with Wheeler about the program at the Automotive News Retail Forum NADA in Las Vegas. Let's start with this. How did your interest in mentoring get started? Well, there's not a lot of mentors really for women in the automotive industry, and it's not my first rodeo, you can all tell. So I've been in this business 39 years. And I always said, when I got to that point where I could put out that hand and help someone else, mm -hmm. that I would do it. So in 2003, I'd been on a foreign service assignment with another manufacturer, and I came back to the United States, and I was running the Women's Business Energy Organization okay. for what is now Stellantis. <laughs> and I decided it was time to do something. And we had about 1,500 members, so I started a mentoring program. In the first year I started it, I actually used an outside agency to kind of help me get it started. And then once we launched that first year and took a couple hundred women through the program, I went, this isn't that hard. I should be able to create something that's even bigger and better. 
And I have literally done it every year since 2003. So a few hundred people go through the program. And what's really fun about it is it's expanded throughout our entire company now at Nissan. And I've now started what's called Mentoring Circles, where I have someone that's like the mentor, someone works with them. And then there'll be 10 people in the group and they meet and then they meet one-on-one -on -one with their mentors as well. And it was, uh, it was funny because PR was like, let me get this straight. So a couple hundred people, I'm like, no, there's now 2,000 people <laughs> at least that I've probably assisted along the way. Wow. So uh, the mentoring circle, is it then like five mentors and five mentees and they share insights as a group? So I have 10 mentoring circles. So I have 10 directors or VPs leading each of the circles, and then there's 10 participants in each of the groups. Okay. So, yeah. And it's a large group. It's a large group. <laughs> we have set criteria that we go through, like when we have actual presentations, and it's always, you know, they may have to do some homework ahead of time, prepare, think about themselves, what they're trying to gain. And it's really helpful because everybody grows. And we, in the very beginning, we'll ask each group, what is it that they really want to concentrate on over the next year? What's always interesting is you get done with the year, and then someone's like, no, I want to continue to be a mentor or a mentee and work with this person. And so it goes on and on and on. And we pay it forward. It's a fantastic thing. Just to get a sense from the audience, how many of you are a mentor to someone? A few. A few. A few. How many of you have a mentor and have had a mentor? Good, just a few, but a good number. All right. So there's some experience out there uh, with it. So with something like the mentoring circles, it's not necessarily a, some of them turn into longer term relationships, but it's yes. not like a commitment to a decade or 20 years together. No, no you're, you're committing to a year. And I always say the onus is on the mentee, the person that's being assisted because they're going to get out of it what they put into it. Mm -hmm. So if they come into the monthly session and they didn't prepare anything and they didn't look at what we, the subject was going to be that we were going to be working on or talking about, we're probably not going to get a whole lot because they're going to be kind of sitting and listening versus really getting involved in the conversation. And then what happens is then they are placed with one-on-one -on -one meeting again in that month with their mentor. So it's like they almost have like a double opportunity to talk about the different topics. Mm -hmm. What they're struggling with, what they're exactly. trying to understand. Does it help for women to have other women as mentors or can it help for them to have a, a male mentor? So it's interesting you should ask this question. So back in 2003, it was started as a woman's program. Mm -hmm. It has not been a woman's only program since about 2004. I quickly realized that there's a need no matter where you're at. And so I encourage, you know, everyone to be a part of the program. I would say right now, so I run a women's business energy uh, organization. Uh, I'm the major sponsor uh, at Nissan, but my WBST, which is the, the, the name for it, as uh, mentoring circles, they're probably almost, I know Archangelo is here today. He's one of my RVPs. I would say it's probably 40% men, 60% okay. women. Yeah. And our membership is interesting because our membership in the Women's Business Synergy Organization, because of all the different things we do for professional development, we probably have about 25% are men. Because it seems like for you know, a young woman trying to find her way, there are things they can learn from other women about what they've accomplished and maybe things they can learn from men about how they might think differently about problem solving and career planning. You are 100% right. I, I always say to people, the only way we're actually going to move forward is to have an honest and transparent conversation. So you need to really say to a female, like, you know, oftentimes women will say, I go into a meeting, but my voice isn't heard. Those are a very typical conversation that comes up in a mentoring session. Yep. And we'll talk about what are some of those tools of how do you get your voice heard. Mm -hmm. And it's been great. I can love it. And, and the feedback, by the way, we always do surveys at the end of each session, at the end of each year. And the scores are always phenomenal. And we get the feedback of what we need to change and alter. So it continues to get stronger. What are some of the, the structures or the best practices that make a mentorship you know, more effective or I don't know, official as opposed to just being like an older friend that you talk to sometimes? Number one, I always encourage people, if you're going to, like I have a formal process where we call it, the, it's almost like speed dating where we literally have them do an application. We have all the mentors fill out applications that want to do it. We have the mentees fill out an application. And the questions in those applications 
are about what is it that are your strengths, what do you think are your challenges, what do you want to accomplish, what do you like to do outside of work, and then what we do is we literally look at the applications and we start matching people. And it really helps because we'll put someone that's like a, a coach that's got really good strengths in a particular area and we'll put with someone that has weaknesses and and you know that's normally how we start placing people the other thing that we encourage in the very beginning is to sit down and have a conversation together with them the two of them so like mentoring circles is like the bigger group but the one-on-ones we encourage them to sit down and talk about what is it that you want to accomplish what are some of the specific things that come up in their reviews from their manager because that's always very insightful to find out if there's something that's holding a person back, what do they want to accomplish in their career. Uh, the other thing that we always say is we, re- we really encourage them to understand and respect confidentiality. That's important. It's really important. You can't have a relationship with someone if you feel that when you tell them something, they're going to turn around and tell your boss or say something that could potentially be used against you later. So that's one of the things that's like an absolute commitment we make. And then, like I said, because I've been doing this for so long and I have a group of wonderful people that I work with, we have a whole curriculum now of what we encourage and what we go through and train on. Uh, so that you have refined year after year. Yes, it keeps getting better. It keeps getting better. So, Are there patterns in the things that people are seeking that, that when you ask them, what do you want to get out of this year of a mentorship? Are there one or two or three things that come up the most? It's changed a little bit over the time. One of the things we're now seeing is especially, I wouldn't call it for people that are having families, they're looking for how do I do it all? How do I continue to continue in my career but find that balance? And I think after, especially after we went through COVID, people were getting greater balance with their families Mm -hmm. and then you've gone back into a work environment. So for us, we have, um, we're encouraged to be back in the office a couple days a week it's not mandatory, but that's what's encouraged. So it's more for class functional. Well, some of the people, you know, then now they're trying to figure out, okay, how does that work to manage my family mm-hmm. and what's happening? So that tends to be a topic, especially in the last few years. It's come up quite a bit. And always, always, it's about career and how do they continue to move forward in their career. And to me, that's more about you have to have a plan. You need to figure out what your strengths are. What is it that you like to do? What don't you like to do? Are you willing to get further education or learning to continue to improve? So we spend quite a bit of time in that area as well. It's been fascinating to me. This last mentoring circle that I just did a month ago, one of the topics that came up is I had them read a study that had just come in from Harvard. And one of the things that came out was they encouraged this conversation about what's important to you in in life and what, what is it that you really want out of a work environment. Number one thing that came back from every person that was in our group they wanted flexible work time. Hmm. Number one, it wasn't pay. It wasn't, I know that I've got a good career path. Mm-hmm. They wanted that flexible work environment where they could choose. So that was something that I was like, okay, that's a little bit of an aha for me because that means we need to be open and understanding of that as we continue. And I think most employees have realized that, but it's hard. I don't know how many dealers are in the, in the room here. But I think that's really hard because the dealership environment is not necessarily always super conducive to that, it's depending on what you do mm-hmm. at the dealership, especially. But it is something uh, that we've heard throughout the day and uh, the way you know some dealers are trying to address it. Uh, but it's, so, it's always interesting to me when we hear the same concerns or the same yes. challenges you know, at the retail level and for the manufacturers. Exactly. And this is, I mean, your programs are across all disciplines, right? All so disciplines. it's sales or marketing, it's engineers and exactly. everybody. So anybody at Nissan can join my, my, my organization and they can come to this. And we actually now in our regions, our regional offices across the United States, we also have them participating. And that, that brought a different set of challenges because all those meetings were being handled then via Zoom. Yeah. And how do you make that still effective? And what we're finding is it's still worthwhile if periodically can get that face-to-face in person mm-hmm. to happen. Judy Wheeler is Nissan's U.S. Vice President of Sales and Regional Operations. We spoke at the Automotive News Retail Forum NADA in Las Vegas. That's Daily Drive for today. I'm Jamie Butters. And I'm Kellen Walker. Thanks to Automotive News Coordinating Producer Jake Neer, as well as our own Michael Martinez and Gail Howe for their reporting for today's podcast. 
You can get the latest news on mentorship, earnings results, and everything happening in the auto industry at autonews.com. Come back tomorrow for my conversation with Autofy Chief Marketing Officer Carrie Wise about how car buyers shop for finance and insurance products online. Really what we see it as is a way to solve some of these major pain points, you know, the bottleneck at the desk. Yes. Right? How do we enable either your sales team to do more with some management oversight, right? So that we don't have that back and forth to the desk. If you enjoy the podcast, remember to like, leave a review and subscribe so you never miss an episode.